we have a quorum and it's 601 so I'd like to call the meeting to order yay um, before we do anything besides ensuring a quorum there are a couple of things to add to the agenda um, the first there are three additional contracts for approval you have those there uh, the first name listed was in our packet from before there are two new additional uh, teacher contracts and one administrator to approve. Um, so I would like to add that to the consent agenda. Um, also for the consent agenda and approval um, of a request uh, for reserve funds um, for the gym floor, additional work for the gym floor. Do we have to vote to add those to the agenda? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think so I'll I'll move to add those to the consent agenda. We've got the um, teachers um, contracts. There was three, and then the administrator. Is that what you said? Well, it's two additional. Two, two, oh, two additional back, yeah. and the administrator, and then the um, additional funding for the okay. board. And I'm sorry to interrupt your motion, but I'd also like to add um, oh, the topic of personnel uh, into the executive session section. Okay. And add the uh, topic of personnel to the con or to the agenda for executive session. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Please say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Excellent. Consider them added. Cannot write and talk. Uh, all right. Well, um, meeting purpose. Uh, we have a continuing conversation um, about about pol policy um, governance policy four point one. Um, just to continue our pretty fruitful conversation from last meeting. But what I'm really excited about for this meeting. Um, is the presentation on Portrait of a Graduate. So thank you for being here, and, and I look forward to that part of the agenda. I'd like to now open up for public comment. I'll read the preamble here. The board welcomes comments, but is not able to take any action on them other than to direct the public to the appropriate staff member or to the complaint procedure. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. Time may not be ceded to another speaker. Comments are to be addressed to me, the board chair, or the board as a whole, not to any individual on the board, on the staff, or in the public. Please raise your hand, both in person and online, and wait to speak until you are asked to by myself. Please identify yourself with your first and last name and your town of residence. Please refrain from restating comments that have already been shared. You can express agreement with those comments. Order and decorum shall be observed by everyone shouting and profanity are prohibited as the board chair i will maintain the order and decorum of the meeting and with that i invite public comment and if anybody online is interested in public comment please just raise your hand all right Seeing none. Going once, going twice. All right. Then, moving on. Limited. Uh, excellent. We're moving on to what I'm so excited about mm -hmm. uh, the portrait of the graduate um, committee, which I'm actually on that committee, but I'm going to turn it over to Heather when she has a moment. Are we up? Yes. All right, you guys are up. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Ava and Elena, student representatives for the portrait of a graduate. Um, Lane, can you uh, share some videos? I can try. All right. Um, probably the best way to do is to, to do the presenter mode if you can. Um, um, can. But we want people at home to be able to see it as well? Yeah. So, so if you want to log into the meeting, Oh. Because um, there's the, the Zoom, and then you can present it through the Zoom. Okay. If that makes sense. Well, actually, Echo? Uh, you should not. I would just make sure that your um, speaker is off on your computer. 
because it's going to use the owl for the speaker. You'll see. I'm going to try it. I'm going to be confident. Go for it. Turn off my speaker. And then oh, I actually, do a sorry about that. Turn off, your, turn off your turn off your speak turn on your speaker, turn off your sound. The sound. Yeah. yeah. That's what That's I what speaker. Is it on? It is it is up here. Oh yeah. It is. Yeah. There you go. Mm, it's uh, actually that one. Okay. Do uh, I have the right to present? Yeah. How do I do that? Uh, they keep changing the symbols this down here. Right here. It's this one. That one. Yep. Okay. <coughs> so I do. I usually do a, a, a window, tab. but. A tab. Yep. And I want this equity up here. Share. I'll let you know. It looks like it's working. All right. There you go. Is it switching to the correct tab or no? It's not. How do I stop it? Stop presenting. Okay. I would I would go to probably either show entire screen or show window. That way you can pick the window that opens up that's the presentation. Okay. Oop, that, oop, you hit shared tab. You want me to do this one? Yeah. And that way when it opens up, you just select the window that you want to be presenting from. There you go. Amazing. Is there volume? Today is our second day There's no volume, of right? launching our portrait of the red. We're teaching the students to be facilitators. Inspires kids to like graduate going on in life. This work is going to help us check in with the community to make sure that our ends are in line with what our community wants our schools to be producing in terms of the end result of our entire district. We think our strengths of this district and what we think could be worked on within the district. We're going to do community dinners, attend faculty meetings, send out surveys. They're going to reach out to their classmates and peers and collect information to inform our portrait of a graduate. We have five stations right now that students are circulating through to start to practice collecting that data. The community will be invited very soon to start giving us this information and those invitations will be coming from students. I think it's so important for students to have a sense of control and buy-in to their education. Okay. And then there's the second one. This one. Is this the same one I did before? Yes. Todd's coming to help here. We met in the media center, about 30 of us, mostly students, a few adults and facilitators, and they unpacked every submission. We had sent out a survey to the community, so we had all of those submissions. Students had gone to faculty meetings and we had those submissions. They had gone into classrooms and had students submit their ideas. We had hundreds of pieces of paper and items to read and sort of been synthesized to say, wow, a lot of people really talked about inclusion. So that goes up on the board. And a lot of people talked about communication skills. That goes on the board. We tried to get down to 15 common themes. That's what we're doing. We're trying to listen to everyone's voice. Voice. Okay, I think it's fine. All right, I'm going to stop presenting. Yes, yes. Stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate you moving it to the master machine. Thank you. What's that? I said I emailed the link to Lane. What do you want me to?
volunteer for this language. All right. I think we can just move forward with letting the students talk at this point. We're, We're not getting any sound online. We're trying to fix yeah, it. Hang on. Hang on. There you go. There you go. Back. Back. We got our tech person yeah, on. I don't think my email should be up there for everybody to see. No. Um, here, do you want, you just want the, the YouTube video link? You're going to type it in? Yes, sir. Apparently, it's only here. Where is, where's the link? It's in my YouTube channel. Oh, um, here, I'll, I'll tell you the you link. Want for a minute. <laughs> Make yourself go down. Here, the link is here. Just Sorry. hang with us. Oh, yeah. Here, it's uh, KCBY. Can I just give you the code, the YouTube code? Yeah. KCV. Wait, we took we took like, get that. Mm -hmm. It's on the RTCC YouTube channel. So we're getting us set up in the new office today. In Charlie, you guys moved in. We moved. We have the movers were here. Is the owl turned off? Because Sam so said he wasn't getting the crucial stuff, stuff we got today. Yeah. Yeah. No, we can all that. The cabinets and stuff are coming. We won't be getting any. Is it Mexican there? Oh yeah. You guys are. So much better. All right, you got it? Mm -hmm. You're the best, Tom. Are you sure they can hear? Yes. Sam, can you hear at home now? Awesome. Sam gave us the thumbs up. Yep. <clears throat> we met in the media center, about 30 of us mostly students, a few adults as facilitators, and they unpacked every submission. We had sent out a survey to the community, so we had all of those submissions. Students had gone to faculty meetings and we had those submissions. They had gone into classrooms and had students submit their ideas. We had hundreds of pieces of paper and items to read and sort of then synthesize and say, wow, a lot of people really talked about inclusion. So that goes up on the board. And a lot of people talked about communication skills. That goes on the board. We tried to get it down to 15 common themes. So that's what we were doing. We were trying to listen to everyone's voice and pull it together so that we can have this one document that's a representative of all of those submissions. We also had a graphic artist come in and talk to us about symbols we might use in the poster that would also speak to the community and people put out ideas for that so we're hoping to have a really beautiful graphic to put in front of the community in just a couple weeks. Okay, thank you everyone for your patience with our um, technology. And uh, Ava, Ava and Elena are here. Um, and where do you want us to be? Come join us at the table for okay. this, this part and just tell us about yeah, your experience. And, and you don't have to talk a lot or long, but we're, we're just so excited you're here, Ava. And you're such a great speaker and Elena as well. If you could just share with us your connections with the community in this project. Okay, well thank you. Um, well, we worked on the portrait of a graduate and I think you all have a copy of um, the one of our, our drafts of the, the final portrait. Um, and all of the work we did was to really collect all this information from the community um, and prioritize um, what their needs were um, in terms of our, our um, school district. And we put them into was it seven pillars. Yes. Um, and that's what these are on this piece of paper. Um, and the pillars are sort of like the the almost the categories that people um, were prioritizing. Um, and they go into more detail. But um, so the 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 pillars are creative problem solver, 
resilient, healthy, and self-directed, life skills and technical skills, caring, connected community member, engaged, lifelong learner, effective communicator, and critical thinker. Um, yeah, so we, we found a, that a lot of um, elementary school uh, elementary students. Elementary school and high school and a lot of students and teachers. Uh, these are the things that appeared most in the data that the data that we collected. Yeah. Um, and people have really had a lot to say. Um, and I think that this document will really help us move forward um, with creating a, a environment where everyone feels seen, heard, and valued, and um, is ready for the future. That's the, the main focus of this document is ready for the future. Um, is something that we came up with um, at our last re uh, last retreat. Yeah. Um, and I, it's really helped us um, integrate with the community, I guess. Um, and the little kids' stuff was very, very fun to read. Yeah. Some funny <laughs> things in there. Mm -hmm. Very funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they had a lot to say. Um, and oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So we'd like now to do some fine refinements, you know, if any typos are found or um, if some things are, could be condensed more. Um, so it's not quite done, but it's really close. Um, and so we're really open to any feedback or, or changes that are recommended. It and is a work in progress. It is. And then what we'd like to do is have um, a little bit cleaner of a uh, a version up that we can put up at the graduations and other celebrations of learning at the end of the year and sort of ask the community, can you live with this? Um, do you like this? Uh, what's your feedback? And uh, make any final tweaks that are needed and then roll it out um, at the beginning of the next school year, both with professional development for teachers and also for- um, Collectibles for the kids. Y yes, <laughs> that sounds perfect. <laughs> Um, so that is our update on the portrait of a graduate um, report and plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This was a lot of work in a short amount of time, mm -hmm. and I am extremely impressed. Not to say Thank I you. doubted you, but <laughs> it's a short amount of time. Yeah. So. Well, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So once you've rolled this out, like what does that look like? Just telling people what it is? So a, the soft rollout will be to have it visible to the community at the end of the year celebrations of learning and maybe have uh, an opportunity for a little bit more feedback. Um, but the finally adopted, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we'd like to start with professional development for teachers. So teachers take time to unpack it and think about using it to guide instruction. Uh, we'd like to include it in the advisories and morning meetings with students. And the next step in the process will be to create a strategic plan, which will be a year-long process um, that will again involve the community and ownership linkage you know, with the board to talk about, OK, here's our aspiration. How do we get there? Like, how do we build in meaningful project-based learning across all grades um, so that students become effective communicators and have an opportunity to speak to various audiences, right? And hone that skill over time. And so uh, this is not the end of the work at all. It's really sort of a beginning. And I think Lane also has some thoughts about the ends, possibly using it as part of the ends. Yeah, I think that's one of the discussions that the board um, might possibly have is that typically a portrait of a graduate, the purpose of it, that whole process is actually to create a mission statement, which is the equivalent of your end statement. 
And so um, it's once things are in kind of a, a complete and final form, once it's gone out to the community and you know, you've got broad, broad acceptance of it, I think it might be worth a, a discussion at the board level of, you know, do we adopt this in place of the ends? Do we try to merge the two? What, what, what do we do? How do we enact this, um, this work that the community has told us they want us to engage in? So, yeah. Which kind of segues into that next strategic planning session for board discussion? Um, I just have oh, a question. About yeah, that. it does. Um, <laughs> The strategic plan that you, you just spoke of, there was a strategic planning whole thing done a few years ago, and I don't know where that's at, but is that integrated into this, or is it a completely separate completely strategic plan? Completely separate. The, they actually did, they started a, a lot of good work. Um, I, I wish you could remember the gentleman's name that, that came in. It was the old, Winston. old Winston. Yeah, yeah. the superintendent. What ended up happening was at the end of the the process, um, people kind of stopped and said, "Wait a minute! You know what that strategic planning is? Is that this is is prescribing the ends, what we what we do, as opposed to what we're trying to achieve?" And so the the board at the time kind of had this discussion. Well, well, um, those are those are means. That's that's up to the you know the administration and whatnot to decide. And so you know we have looked at those, um, especially in terms of some of the planning and some of the work that I have done. There actually were about thirty or forty percent of what was on that document had already been completed in terms of those means. Um, so it's still there. It's I do refer to it as as we do some planning from from time to time. But um, I think this is where you're. You know, my my recommendation is this. This is kind of where you're at right now. Um, is the potential of of this? You know, maybe replacing your end end statement or updating it. Right. I mean, I actually think if this is part of the natural progression of that because mm -hmm. this included the community, which includes the people who were working with Winston. Yep. Um, and I think there there were a few people that said to me, we, we did all that and we don't really understand where it went. Yep. I think this is, you know. It could, I haven't seen step. it, but it could be a great place to start. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't need to start from nothing if we have something to start with. Well, I. It's I think it's over. worth yeah. Yeah. review. I think it's worth all of us reviewing it. Um, and on on that note, um, our July board meeting is typically you know it's if needed. I think on the mm -hmm. on the calendar, um, and I know we've used it for training before. I want to have a discussion about what we'd like to use that for and suggest that this be, um, it be centered around this. We have this portrait of a graduate. It won't be officially, I understand, rolled out till next year and it's a working document or, and a working process, but I think it, it, it has to inform our ends, is my opinion. I'm not mm -hmm. you know, um, demanding that, but I, it does feel like we could really use that meeting to figure out um, to reassess our ends, right? Because the ends are where the community wants us to be, mm -hmm. and now we have a map. Not a map, a, a goal. A goal. An end, yeah, a finish line. And I can give kind of two examples off the cuff <laughs> of the work that Winston did. You know, one of them was to implement, you know, a life skills program, and so that is up and running and ready to go in the fall. We'll actually talk a little bit about that in terms of the... Um, the ends report that comes a little bit later tonight. Um, part of that piece that came out of the work was, you know, to continue the the work um, on the the foundational knowledge piece, which made sense. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why, you know, we're we're looking at a, a potential homework policy um, th that we've been working on. Um, we've had some rich discussions about changing the master schedule at the high school to increase time on learning. We've had discussions this year about um, the use of time, like, you know, two weeks at the end of the year, historically, where the kids go home and do makeup work, which is, you know, not effective use of time. I mean, they combine it with the um, 
portfolio defenses, but the, the students only come in for a limited amount of time over those two weeks to do their portfolio of defense. And so recouping that time as part of, um, you know, Im improving academics for the, for the students um, in terms of the foundational. And so there, there has been a lot that's been in integrated. You know, I haven't stood up and, you know, put the signs up and this, this is what it is. I could do that and I'd be happy to if that's a, if that's a, a preference, but yeah. <clears throat> So this isn't asking for a vote or anything, but what do people think about um, what that might look like in July, if that's of interest to use our time that way? Um, if people feel we need guidance in that process in reassessing ends, what that might look like? Anyone? Um, oh. I think it's a great idea to do what you were just describing. And I think um, taking on maybe someone else's opinion that's outside of the group mm -hmm. as far as guidance goes would be a great idea. Cool. I don't do know you if have anyone else is on board with that? Do you have thought, are you thinking of someone that you want to bring in? Or do you have like an idea? Um, no, no. But um, <laughs> I think it's worth, you know, talking to VSBA about it and, and really sussing out what we want. If we want it to be more of a training in ends, you know, um, um, producing ends as if there were none or rework the ends, right? That's one way we could go with it. Another way is to have a, a, a working sessions where we're starting with what we already have, seeing if it matches up, you know, big whiteboard, um, which I would think we'd want someone more as a, not mediator, what's yeah. the moderator? Facilitator? Yeah. Facilitator. Facilitator. Lovely word. Um, so, so using that time, not really as training, but a work session. Um, I think it would be awesome if we could get someone to help us organize our ends. Mm -hmm. Not just speak of ends in like a broad, let's like, this is what ends are. You know, you have to go through and figure out if they are. I want to actually go through and figure out if they are what we are yeah. looking for. A working session, yes. a guided working session yes. with so we come away at the with end something. with yes. these are what we want this yeah. to look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure we can do that in two hours. It doesn't have to be two hours. It can be a retreat. It can mm -hmm. be it, you know yeah. it can look ha like however we want it to look and what we're. We How do feel people feel about that? Are we willing to spend a? <laughs> I mean, it's hard to be like, oh yeah, I want to spend my Saturday doing that, but I don't know if. It doesn't have to be a day retreat. It can be a half day retreat. We do have funds for, for you know, training and, and work sessions and you things. Can do so a, we can do know, a lunch. Do a lunch, you do a four, do four hour and a four hour if you, if you think you need we that much time. Outside. The we facilitator, if, I think yeah. if you outline for the facilitator what it is that you want to accomplish, mm -hmm. they'll be able to give you a timeline about what they think it'll. That's yeah, a good that's idea. Right. So yeah, why don't we yeah. find out that, and then can we just organize it through email, or do we have to? Organize? Organization, you guys can communicate as much as you want about. Okay. Yeah. yeah, great. Yeah. Does that sound good? I mean, I don't know what everybody else feels. That like. sounds good to that's me. Fine. Yeah, that sounds good to me. If if someone is interested in in uh, poking around and and uh, looking at people who might be a good fit, or I'm offering you up, but Chelsea and I can can do that as well. I'm not talking subcommittee, I'm just talking assigning someone the research. I think that's allowed. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm happy to help look into it. Cool. I can call at the SBA and tell, ask them. Yeah. Do you want okay. me to do that? That'd be great. And then maybe at the June meeting, we can vote I'll look on. look into the portable whiteboard. How about that? Portable, yes, you're on that. Okay. And markers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we, yeah, and we'll we'll bring it back in June at our June meeting to talk about because I assume there will be funds involved if we're mm -hmm. looking at hiring someone to facilitate. Yep. Not just eat. How much is available? I think we put in ten grand. You'll be in the new fiscal year um, after June thirtieth. Mm -hmm. um, so there's at least ten grand there, if not more. I'd have to go back and look at what we put in. Great. Okay. Yay. Thank you. 
Um, okay, we're going to move into monitoring. Look at that, 631, you guys. Did you agree? Um, so governance policy 4.1. Sometimes it can feel a little awkward to try to kind of recreate the, the brain space we were in um, in the other meeting, but I heard from several people that, that they felt it was productive. Um, conversation, so uh, thank you, Linda, for sending out the chart again. If that, sure. if more things have come up for people. Um, you know, uh, ways that we could get to always rather than never. Uh, I was actually looking back at, <clears throat> Anne sent us an email on April 13th uh, that was a, an email exchange she had with Susan from the VSBA, I think. And of course, I printed it out. And then, I mean, here we go, Morganson, yeah. Um, talking about the uh, um, return on investment, but it's a social return on investment. but. I think something that came up, this speaks to it, the last sentence um, that she wrote here. Board, uh, otherwise, well, with it, I feel that having boards and management really think about and work on what demonstrates achievement, progress, accomplishment, while not easy, is one of the biggest strengths policy governance has. Otherwise, boards tend to just go through the motions, weighing in on budgets and activities, but without really ever truly knowing whether or not it has been worthwhile. And I feel like that sentiment was coming up. Um, in terms of how we govern, that we, you know, sometimes feel that we're rubber stamping. No, am I babbling? Well, I am babbling. Answers, yes, but thoughts, ex mm -hmm. things that came up for people from the conversation. <sighs> I will also say this, not only did I hear from board members that they enjoyed the conversation, I heard from several community members that were at that meeting or listening to that meeting that they appreciated the conversation that we had started, which, while it's lovely to hear that we enjoyed our conversation, I think it's, uh, that was really uh, great to hear. Um, they like us talking out what more we can do, what differently we can do. How we might want to change that policy or not. Yeah. I think it helps the community understand more of what we do as well by having these open discussions. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know how to pick up on where we left off last time. I don't know if we should just start going through each one again and see what comes up. Yeah. Or. So why don't I go ahead and read just the introduction? I won't read each one through six um, and see if that kind of sparks people with new thoughts or something they meant to say last week or anything. Um, policy number 4.1, governing style. The board will govern lawfully, observing the principles of the policy governance model with an emphasis on outward vision rather than an internal preoccupation, encouragement of diversity in viewpoints, strategic leadership more than administrative detail, clear distinction of board and superintendent roles, collective rather than individual decisions, future rather than past or present, and proactivity rather than reactivity. That last one, I certainly wrote down like three or four times because I think people kept coming back to it that. Being proactive. Yeah. And almost feeling like we've had to be reactive um, when big things come up. But how can we be proactive either before they do or to <clears throat> avoid them? Big things. Well, I think it was it was discussed last time, but if we adhere to all of the policies, then that would be proactive mm -hmm. by 
saying this is our policy we have set in place when something does come up. And then if it's something new, I feel like we've always been pretty good about, like, oh, we don't have a policy or, or some, like, rules on this. And so we then make one. Do like you? Like policy. Hmm? Yeah. That. Yeah. Do you feel like this particular policy, in hindsight, had we pulled it out and had it right in front of us when one of these things came, when these big things have come up in front of us and we had to react to. If we have this in front of us, could it have helped? Did we follow it? Um, could it have helped guide us in some pretty tumultuous um, incidents? I think so, yes. I think so too, because the flag policy was brought to us by Lane, it's not necessarily. Um, reacting to something that happened here, correct? It was it was like outside and, thoughts, and we were like, okay, we need to. In we anticipation need to, of a court ruling, right? Said, oh, this might impact the, the so, previous decision on this. That's proactive. That's proactive. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. So I guess just thinking about certain situations where it's like, okay, we don't have a policy. The, this is something that we can anticipate in the future. So let's be proactive. So in that sense, like, that's a good example of us being proactive mm -hmm. right okay I just want to make sure that that's what that and I, I commend you for taking that on that was a difficult and it, it did stir up a lot of thoughts and emotions which is to be expected but it is it's it's good to note that we were being proactive in that situation mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah I mean I'm looking at number two the, the what I uh, underlined here, informed by expert sources, both internal and external to the organization. I think that one of the things we're good at is asking for help, is reaching out for guidance. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if that's a tricky one because we needed legal um, legal advice, but I wonder about reaching out for input from different stakeholders is something we can do to be proactive. Um, you know, our, our connection to the district is through Lane, but that doesn't mean we can't have the principals come in. I mean, they used to, mm -hmm. but I think we did away with that because it was, and Katie, I think I saw you on there, so you may be able to, um, uh, speak to this, but well, I seem to recall when we She's did away there. with that process. She is there? Kate yes, she is. is listed, yeah. um, we felt it was because we were kind of asking them to present what we were already getting in our packets. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an opportunity to have a connection with them, not in a supervisory role, obviously that's Lane, but to take, just to be informed directly. Yeah. That seems proactive. Um. I think I think it's um, it's a good idea. Um, one of the things I think that we had touched on, I don't know if it was the last meeting or the previous, was the idea that, you know, we talk an awful a lot at times about the ends and, and you know what that means in terms of student achievement. But the piece that gets lost in the process is this idea of the means is, okay, what are all the things that are actually happening in the district? You know, are, are, are folks aware that, you know, we've revamped the, the, the curriculum across, you know, all seven disciplines? Are folks aware that we brought in, you know, a, a top tier research math um, program for both the elementary and for the high school? Are they aware that we've done the same thing for ELA? Those are the, the pieces, the discussion that the community could latch on to to understand that there is a significant amount of work going on. And I think those communications with the principals where they talk about their schools, um, 
what they're working on and what the impact has been in terms of student outcomes would be, be, be really valuable. Just, I think so too, and yeah. I think we're reminded often, or we you know remind ourselves mm -hmm. that we can't prescribe the means, but that certainly doesn't mean that we shouldn't know about them or understand them or ask questions. Yep. You know, this we're, we that isn't meant to direct them in any way, but um, or get involved in the operations. But understanding the operations and and no offense to Lane, but yep. through other voices and sources as well, yep. um, I I think is really important. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's valuable. Um, I think one of the reasons that it was kind of toned back on, kind of remember going through the agenda planning sessions was, and it, there was good logic to it at the time, was this idea that um, if we're just monitoring EL and ENDS and what the principals are coming in and presenting isn't really related to the ENDS as they've been interpreted, then you know why are we spending our time on this? I think that was the, the conversation at the time. Um, um, probably two years ago or three years ago now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it, it, there's there's um, value in kind of a formal report, yes, this is what we're doing, but then the informality of how do you think it's going? Yeah. How, how what's the feedback you're getting from the faculty? Again, that's not us no. trying to needle, um, but, it, but it is a, a, a check-in. And Katie, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what do you think about, do you have any thoughts about what I've been rambling about? I, I think it all makes a lot of good sense. And I know that Lisa and I have enjoyed before having the opportunity to share what's happening specifically in our building related to the efforts that, you know, that you're all looking at, you know, whether it be a program um, that we are implementing or what we're even doing is for, for some summatives that are of note for you to, to be able to understand um, in certain grade levels or in certain content areas, I think is only going to better than, you know, your work. So I, I think it makes good sense. And I, I, I think we would all appreciate that opportunity. Absolutely. I, th I think it's also an opportunity as folks are hearing, you know, the work that's engaged, not just by administration, but by the work that the teachers are doing at their level, you know, within the classrooms and, and mm -hmm. carrying out a lot of the focus that we have. It's an opportunity to, to um, value um, through the discussions, you know, the work that they're, they're engaged in. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think it's a good idea. And since we will be doing some work on our ends and looking at our ends, I think it's just more really useful information for us to have from the people doing the work, the means, uh, like to get to where we're reassessing. Yeah. In a way that we are not right now. Mm -hmm. I yeah. wonder if there's other stakeholders that we should also be visiting with teachers and students and <laughs> community members and I don't know. And let's not forget that um, we have in the past been invited to to go into classes and just observe, um, which I shamefully have not taken advantage of, but um, but want to. And I think that's a really great way to stay connected. Um, yeah. So, but I agree. Yeah. The the other um, possibility, which I don't, I don't think has been used some, as I'm scanning through my memory as I'm sitting here, is that you know if there's bigger discussions that that to have with stakeholders, is you can always also put it on the board agenda. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're going to set aside you know 20 minutes to have the community come in and just talk about this. Um, and there there is nothing wrong with that. Um, that's that's uh, that's usually a good thing to do, especially if if um, you might be considering a weighty matter or considering a policy change, or mm -hmm. you know to get that feedback. Um, because sometimes, um, why I like the the forums and things is sometimes they'll pick up on nuances that oh, that would be an unintended consequence. I want to thank you for letting me know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. So I, I think there's there's a, a lot of possibilities there. Um, yeah, you can always add an item on the agenda um, ahead of time to say, hey, we, we want to have a community discussion about this. 
um, and we'll run it, you know, open form style or however you want right. to run it. Yeah. And I think it's it's this is a great uh, opportunity. Opportunity. This is a great moment because the community is presently engaged thanks to our um, portrait of graduate work. So this would be a good way to show that it's not just when we are doing a project. It's constantly that we want. Uh, Sam had his hand raised. Yeah, Sam. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, I'm wondering what what does the process look like for adding a community discussion to the agenda and just throwing out the idea of maybe being able to use public comment to turn to add it to the next board meetings agenda. Um, sometimes I feel like the fact that we can't act on public comment, uh, it feels like we're deflecting people or hiding hiding behind the policy. Or I, I, I think I think. You know, perception is reality for a lot of community members, and I think that can be perceived as us not being accountable to stakeholders in the in the community. Yeah. I, so, I, so back to the initial question: um, How do you how do you add uh, uh, public I, discussion to uh, to board agenda? Well, I see it as separate from public comment. I think public comment certainly is informative about what is on people's mind, but that particular process, I think, we, we don't mess with that, I think, because it's so short. I mean, we ask people for, you know, three minutes, but to really set aside a section on the agenda for, and, and maybe you're right, maybe it's from something in public comment the month before, the, 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 the trouble I have with that is the amount of time that passes when something's ripe for people. Um, but I also worry about something being brought up in public comment and then speaking about it in that same meeting. Yeah, I don't think, I think that's also tricky. No. So like Lane, I think you touched on this and you do it yourself in open forum uh, format. Yeah. So it's not necessarily an agenda item, although we could put out a call for topics I suppose. Yeah, the, the, I think the I think the logic, just for context, in terms of what Sam is saying, is that you know with the with the open comment, um, the reason that we don't respond is because we have an obligation to have on the agenda what's mm -hmm. going to be discussed, so people know to participate. Mm -hmm. So if we pick up a discussion that comes from open comment that's not on the agenda, other people might want to be weighing in in the community, and they can't. Yeah. And so there is a logic behind. Okay, you know, if the board senses that this is something that you know, we feel the thoughts are incomplete or there, there, there's, there's things to dig into here. Um, it can always be, it could be placed on, a, on another agenda in the future. The other piece that, you know, we've tried to talk with um, community members about is that, you know, if you have something that you want to talk with a board about, you call up, you know, Linda um, and just say, hey, I'd like this on the agenda and then it'll be on the you know, we have the pre-agenda meeting, mm -hmm. you know, she'll put it on there and then, you know, the board chair and, and co-chair get to decide if it's something that stays or not at that point in time. I'm not sure that's clear mm. to yeah. the public. In fact, I know yeah. it's not clear to the public. Mm -hmm. um, that's usually it's, been verbal when people have asked, how do I, how do I talk? Well, this is the process. So I think that we should be really loud with that to make sure people understand that they have that access to suggest things or yeah. At, uh, uh, um, request things for the agenda. And so then in that section of the agenda, that would become an open discussion mm -hmm. where we respond to people saying, I feel yeah. like this, yeah. what are you doing about it? And we say, yeah. like this in the is same what we're way doing, these... this is what there is. Yeah. Well, I think on a prescribed topic though, that's what, yeah, yeah it's gotta be, it it's gotta be, be clear what it's about. So mm -hmm. that other people that might not have been interested in whatever else was going on in the board meeting, if they see this and it's, it's powerful to them or, or a passion, they can come in and, and say their piece. I think um, having open discussion with people who are concerned about things is important because we talked about this at the last meeting. Now that this is like spurring my memory is that, <laughs> We just are silent and we don't say anything and it looks like we don't care or we don't know what we're doing or we don't we're not engaged or you know so i think that is a great thing I, how do we do that i mean do we 
Right. I mean, I think there would be there would have to be a lot of prepping for us just to remind ourselves that we speak as one. Yeah. You know, it 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 would be tricky, um, which I think is also it's hard for us to remember and it's hard to describe to the public. But because we're not involved in operational decisions, um, it doesn't mean we can't acknowledge and it doesn't mean we can't have an open discussion. I just think that we'd have to be very present and and um, verbal and transparent about what we can do and what we can say in terms of opinion. You know, we... Yeah, they always, you know, present it to PH or have them, you know, develop a protocol mm -hmm. that can be read at the beginning. But the the other, one of the reasons that, that I like the open forum format and the listening mm -hmm. sessions is that it's a it's a two way conversation. Um, so so people will come in all the time, you know, good meaning incredibly well that have heard this or heard that, and um, it's nice to be able to have that conversation and say, no, you're you're spot on, or or, or well, there's there's this perspective too that might you know, might shape the context behind, you know, what you're hearing. And I think those are important conversations because that can have a very settling effect on um, the community members um, okay. as well. You know, at times it depends upon what the topic is, but yeah. So. And I think, you know, Lane offers things like that. And I think if we offer something like that, it will help to um, <clears throat> reinforce that while we are partners and we're working together, we are also kind of independent bodies for the district, yep. which I think is important to reinforce. So new agenda items will maybe be principals giving their... Us inviting, yeah, the principals to... So do we do one at a time or all of them the same night? I think... Uh, what do people think? I think um, you mean a principal from each school. Is that what you mean all at once? I think um, maybe one at a time because I think there's a lot different, there's a lot more going on in one school maybe than another. Issues are different. Yep. Um, and I think that there would be a lot of information mm -hmm. at once to process for so everyone. Should we have one at each meeting? I think we could ask them what they prefer. It might be helpful to have all the elementary at yeah. once, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. separate from the high school. The best thing to do, um, especially if there's you know ongoing conversations with the community, is um, you know to tell them what you're interested in hearing about. You know that, that's that's a way to start it, um, and so they know what they're preparing for, what they know um, to come in and talk with with, with folks about. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you know they they all have advisory councils that are up and running. You know. If the board doesn't have a specific topic that they might be interested in, then you can kind of leave it to the, the principals. And um, what they can do is they can probably talk about the pertinent subjects that are coming up in their advisory discussions with, the, with their, their communities, uh, you know, just to make people more informed. But it does, does help a little bit to, you know, have an idea to frame kind of what you want them to talk about. Their communities about. being their teachers? Uh, it students. includes teachers, uh, parents, and, and, and students, and yeah. It might be more comfy for families and principals to do it at like the respective schools that we have the meetings at, like, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, when I mean? we show up, yeah. Like elementary yeah. when we're up there, Brookfield, yeah. Braintree, That's because then, you, you know. Mm -hmm. as, as a principal, um, trying to remember, I, I usually, I did a, did a lot of the presentations because we were doing a lot of change work. Um, but a typical year, you know, at a minimum, would, would I would probably present three times. Um, but it was usually about it was about you know the the, the school data. Um, it was about any kind of policy changes or things that we were working on that were big that we wanted a community input on. You know, we do those presentations at the board meeting. Um, That's kind of another avenue to get that that input and that feedback. Um, so, what are the things we want to hear about? Um, should we let the public decide, but maybe by, or maybe ask the principals, like, what is a hot topic that's come up at the each school? 
So hot topics. Curriculum. What it's looking yep. like. Yes. Uh, uh, I think some component of future, I think, is important um, for whether it be job placement or uh, college placement or, um, you know, whatever it may be, that next step. I think that's a main point of high school or pre preparing for the future. And I think that's probably a topic on people's minds. Yeah, the guidance department, that's one thing that, that is easy to present. Um, I forgot what the document is called, but they prepare a document every year that, you know, talks about where the kids are going to college, you know, what the basic test scores were and things like that. And that's usually a good topic for discussion. Um, the tech center typically come, can come in and, and talk a little bit about placements um, and, you know, what the future plans are of... Uh, you know, the students that are seniors and, and moving on out, you know, are they going directly into industry? If so, you know, which industries are we connecting them with? Um, are they headed off to college? Um, are they headed off to a, a, you know, a college level, you know, technical center? Um, and so those are good things um, to have conversations about. But I wish I could remember the name of that document. It will come to me. So future, Sam, for the high school would be like go college, what's that, that's looking like, and then job placement, and then maybe future for the, Elementary schools would be like transitioning to the high school, like different transitioning into I don't know, <laughs> transitioning into kindergarten and first grade. Yeah, I mean, what the those, beginning yeah, stuff the little too, are doing, especially coming out of COVID. Yeah, I know it's been a lot. Different. Especially after with all, with the new preschools that we built. So, yeah. yeah. Um, are you thinking of the school profile lane, Katie? School profile, you've got it. Katie got it. You've got it. Awesome, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't worked at the high school level in a while, so some of this stuff eludes me for a bit. Mm. Okay, so what's our process here for getting this off the ground? I think a couple things. I think um, j I just want to mention again that a lot of people don't know that they can request agenda items or request things that we talk about. And I think that's linked with this because we'll want people engaged and, and to come and hear their principal um, kind of talk about the state of their school or, or a specific topic. So it, it, I'm kind of piggybacking on your question, how do we get that out there initially? Board could write a you know, a quick little make a statement. letter to the make community. A statement. Yeah, it, this is a part of your ownership linkage. Yep, mm -hmm. I, mean, I think this is a great idea. So our next meeting is in Brookfield. Would it be possible to? You mean mean to Patty out there? Yeah. Um. We asked her if she'd like to David Roller be a part of our next meeting. Oh, Brookfield. That's like a branch. Sorry about that. Yeah. Or in this case, potentially Kara if it's Brookfield. I think that would be a great idea, especially since he's retiring. Yeah, and and right. Kara is is taking over, so it mm -hmm. would be a good an opportunity, even if it's just an, being able to provide her a, a venue for an introduction to the Kara greater community. Kara is going to be the principal at Brookfield. Uh, Houston. Houston, yeah. Kara Houston, not Kara Merrill. No, Kara Houston, correct. yeah. <laughs> the current current assistant principal at uh, at RES. Oh. That's 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 a, a great idea. Also, this letter to the community thing, I love too, that this is something that we'll start to do. And oh, by the way, you can write to Linda. I don't mean to flood your inbox, I just. No, um, and what I do is if I get an email, which I rarely do, mm -hmm. I forward it to the board chair. Yeah. There's only been a few times. So. Okay, well, but this is the kind of thing we need to um, compose and then everyone needs to approve it so can we do this before the next board meeting that's what, sub that's what subcommittees are for yeah sorry about that sam go ahead no that, that was exactly my question and just going back to process um as a as a new board member i when we make a public statement um as a board as our own board voice how do we go about that who writes that and uh how is it distributed 
Well, I've never done it before, so this is kind of a new thing. So it's it's <laughs> like it's like forming a subcommittee. The board um, takes a vote to empower somebody or a group of people to do the writing, outlines what the expectations are. Um, when they feel they're complete, they would bring that piece back to the full board, and you'd vote on it and say, "Yep, we're in approval. Let's send it out." So, Sam, in terms of process, it is not possible for us to do this before the next board meeting unless we call a special board meeting to um, vote on the letter. But what we can do is vote to create someone to write it. Yep. Not the clerk. <laughs> seems, seems a natural fit. Though, yeah. Right? Uh, <laughs> you'll take uh, It's not your job description, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the other piece is there are resources, um, you know, Ben Merrill, um, who's maintained our website for um, years and done a, a fantastic job. He's also a PR person. That's a great idea. So it's if, a, if right um, that's an easy I connection, if you before. decide somebody, okay. just right. reach out to him. He'll, he'll prepare it. If you give him, give him a basic statement, he'll, he'll clean it up and get it good to go. Right. So, well, let's, is anyone interested in being someone to create a kind of base, this is kind of sort of what we want to say. Is there someone interested in it or um, we yes, have not? I can do that. And what we're interested in saying is. I'd also like to be involved. If I could be. OK, so why don't you and me and Ben it. Merrill meet? Because he'll come up with something really good. So but me let's meet first Okay. so we can tell him what we're Or does anyone going. else want to do yeah. this? I think, um, I don't think we need too many people, mm -hmm. no. right. too many chefs in the kitchen to write <laughs> something. Um, maybe just right now, kind of shooting off the hip, what you want to, well, we can all be a part of what we want to include in this letter. Yeah, if, I just, if we point. just have like yeah. a bulleted list, then yeah. I can just send that just off to him. There is something to touch base and on. And he can like, write a letter. Maybe we should just work on this, this over the summer and then have the first kind of thing happen uh, in September. Yeah, that would make sense. New year. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't need to jump right on it. But, but if you just if you decide that you want somebody to work on it, that would be a vote. Okay. Yeah, board vote and nomination and whatnot. Okay, so mm -hmm. should we get the ball rolling on forming that subcommittee? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I nominate. You move to move. create a subcommittee, I think. Okay. Yeah. I move to create a subcommittee on drafting letters to the community regarding um, meetings, adding um, public discussion. Uh, I public discussion. <laughs> public discussion. Thank you. Adding public discussion um, with stakeholders in our community. Got that? Is that good? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did you get all the ers and ums in there too? <laughs> yes. But you're moving to create it and it includes who? Can we do that all? Yeah. In yeah. One this subcommittee would include Chelsea and Hannah. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Do Sam. you want do you want to add that you would include Ben Merrill? Oh. And Ben Merrill. <laughs> or you can try or you can the other way you can say it is, you know, and 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 we authorize them to, you know, seek a Contract. public public relations person to help. Yeah. There you go. Okay, I like that better. Second, second. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. <laughs> All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Do we discuss it now, like what we want in the letter, so that we can? Or do well, you we and need I to vote on this up? Yeah. And then we decide. And then we have the letter written, and we bring it back, and everyone says, "This is good. I want to add this. I want to delete this." And we do another one. Okay. Mm -hmm. That will take all summer, so that's great. <laughs> uh, those opposed? Abstentions. What part of the agenda are we on? We're 4.1. 4.1. Governing style. Policy 4.1, not 
four on the agenda. I think they used up your timeline. Are you staying? Not voting. Okay. Down to okay. Five minutes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, motion passes. All right. Okay, a second review of the ENDS report and ENDS presentation. Yeah, so um, I've got the ENDS presentation kind of queued up to go. Um, easiest thing is to interrupt and ask questions along the way. Um, the only problem for, for those of you that are out in the, uh, in the remote world there, um, I don't get to see you too well if, if you're putting a hand up or things like that, so don't be afraid just to speak up and, and ask a question. Um, I am going to apologize a little bit. Uh, I typically refer to my notes um, considerably when I do the ENDS presentation because there are so many details in terms of data that I do not want to be off. I want to make sure that it's as accurate as possible, plus the fact that it also speeds up the presentation so I'm not going off on tangents um, to, to talk about this uh, a little bit. Um, before we start, and, this, and so I can kind of warm myself up, um, there were discussions or comments um, at earlier board meetings kind of from the community and I think some stuff on front porch forum where folks were saying, hey, you know, the district, you know, the district's at the, at the bottom in terms of um, in terms of performance, and I was trying to dig in to figure out where they were getting that information. Um, and so what I found out is they were referring to the Newsweek um, polling. The Newsweek does rankings um, every year of, of schools. And I've got to talk a little bit about that because I think there's some misconceptions about what that, that is and what that means and actually what it means for our district as a whole. Um, there are about 26,000 high schools um, across the United States. Um, Newsweek actually ranks about the top two-thirds of those high schools. Um, we are in the rankings. And I, I want to say that again. We are in the rankings. We have never been in the rankings before when I look back historically. So that means we've moved up fairly significantly from wherever we were. Um, uh, prior to, and not only are we in the rankings, but we're we're in the bottom third, but we're not at the bottom. Um, and so that is a significant jump in terms of the school from and district from where it started out, you know, 10 years ago or, or seven years ago or six years ago. Um, that's an impress Im impressive achievement to be in those rankings. That said, Newsweek focuses primarily, the, the biggest weight that they give in terms of their rankings is the percentage of students that are taking advanced placement courses. And so typically bigger schools are going to do a little bit better in those rankings because they have more resources, they're able to run more of those AAP programs. But I just want to, I think there were some misconceptions about, based upon the statements that were made out there about the, the, the Newsweek rankings. For the first time this year, we are in the rankings. So that means we've had a significant improvement to be able to get there. So after that little bit of a warm up, um, in terms of the ends, uh, a couple of things I think it's important, and a lot of this presentation is, is uh, meant for folks that are viewing um, and folks that will actually be watching this on ORCA um, later. We usually get about three to 400 people to do watch this, uh, these board uh, meetings on ORCA. So I'm gonna probably provide a little bit more detail than the board meet needs, so I apologize about that, but it's just to make sure that, that other folks are connected. Um, the important thing here is to recognize that the, the ends um, that we're going to be talking about, um, they really only focus on a, a limited set of data, and it's just those data points that are required to measure achievement of the board's broad goals for the district. So there's tons of other data that we could be looking at um, and that we actually do you know, within the district. Um, but if it's not related to the ends and showing our achievement towards them, it is not going to be in this report. And so just a, as a caveat there. Um, in terms of meaningful data, I think it's important to take a look at where the world has been and kind of where we're headed. Um, and it's real important to kind of understand the context uh, of where we've been. Um, please remember um, that executive limitations report and ends reports, they look back at the previous year. 
Um, and so the year that we're looking at tonight in terms of data is actually 2021, 2022. Um, now, to look at the, the context of things, uh, 2018, 2019 was the last normal year for testing. So you're gonna see data from them so that we can compare it to where we are now. In 2019, 2020, there was no statewide testing. In March of that year, that, that is when COVID hit. Um, and the state was reacting, and the, the nation was, to something it had never seen before. And so um, testing was canceled. In 2020, 2021, um, the district spent uh, the entire year in either remote or hybrid instruction. Um, 2021, 22, which is last year, the year of the data that we're looking at, um, the state still had a lot of its quarantine protocols in effect. And so that was the year where, you know, if you had enough kids that were out, we had COVID snow days, so the whole school was shut down. We also had a lot of disruptions um, because of following those quarantine requirements um, where, you know, we might have to shut an, a class down within a building for five days. Um, and so it's important for folks to understand this context that, you know, this was a very disruptive time in terms of the data that we're looking at. Now, I'm not setting this up to say that the data is poor because it's not, it's actually pretty good. I'm setting this up to be able to commend the teachers and the faculty and the administrators for the work they did to have things come out as well as they did. Um, so again, looks, looks backwards. Um, since the district is primarily uh, interested in improving student outcomes, it's important to look at growth over time. And to do that, you, we've got to be able to compare the same data from year to year. And it typically takes about three to five years um, to be able to generate a meaningful trend from, from the data points. Um, the state has kind of made that a little bit difficult um, because it's changed its testing parameters six times in the last eight years. Um, so if you kind of take a look at this in 2015, um, they moved off the old N, the NECAP testing system to SBAC. In 2018, they changed which grades um, were taking uh, the statewide assessment, the SBAC. In 2019, they stopped using, you know, uh, they started the Vermont Science Assessment, which was a new uh, science assessment. In 2020, they didn't do testing at all because that was when the COVID pandemic hit. 2022, which is the year that we're looking at, um, they have still not released state level data. It's still embargoed. But what I was able to do um, was the Secretary of Education had gone and done a news um, conference in late January where he released preliminary data. And so that's the data that this report refers to. Um, and we've got another change that is happening this very year that we are in. The state is doing away with SBAC and the Vermont Science Assessment and moving to a new assessment called Cognia. So again, there is a little bit of an ability to look at the trend lines, um, but it's uh, made things really messy when they keep changing things as, as much as, as they have. Um, for folks that are watching um, from the outside, some basic definitions that's important to know. Um, when we're using the word ends, those are the board's goals for the district, uh, right? Um, interpretations, when we talk about those, um, right now that's how the leadership team has chosen to define the board's goals in terms of what it is we, we are to achieve. Um, interpretations don't state how we're going to achieve that. Um, what they really do is they kind of state the measurements um, that we're going to collect and the data that we're going to collect to show um, that we've met these goals. Um, an interpretation is considered reasonable if what is being measured logically indicates success of the board's goals. Each interpretation also sets a threshold that defines the level of achievement that must be reached um, for the goal to be considered complete or in the policy governance parlance, you know, to be in compliance. Um, as we've come out of the COVID pandemic, we've set up district-wide teacher-based curriculum teams that we're working uh, all this year. And what they are doing right now is they are reinterpreting the ends, um, which makes a lot of sense because the teachers, after all, are the content and learning experts. And so their interpretations are incredibly important. Um, further, uh, their work in developing the ends that is going to state you know, their success with the students um, also helps to increase their buy-in um, and it keeps the goals that they're shooting for kind of fresh in the forefront of their minds. Um, the overall policy goal, um, the policy preamble sets the highest and most global uh, standards in terms of what it means to be successful on the ends collectively on the board's goals. Um, this is because interpreting, because of this interpreting the preamble provides an opportunity to develop the broad strategies 
we use to achieve the ends. In terms of interpreting um, what that preamble means, um, what we currently have developed is this idea that um, it means to have the knowledge, skills, and tools uh, to be prepared for the next stage of their lives in terms of the students. Um, and what that is, it was actually clearly defined in the latter half of the 20th century um, when a nationwide initiative was funded by the federal government to research what skills students would need to be successful in the new economy that was unfolding, which was based on digital information sharing and high technology. The results of their research were codified into three different kind of plans here. Um, the first was the Common Core Learning Standards, the second was the Next Generation Science Standards, and the third was the 21st Century Skills. Um, the, the Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards represent content-based academic knowledge uh, and abilities, while the 21st Century Skills represents process-based knowledge, things like analytical reasoning, collaborative problem solving, and effective communication. Uh, the CC, the NGSS, and the 21st century skills were chosen um, in this interpretation because they are critical in terms of preparing students to navigate the current rapidly evolving digital society. The district is considered in compliance with the overall policy when two conditions are met, when all mature ends are self-sustaining, and when all critical ends are advancing towards their achievement thresholds. And we'll talk about what mature and critical means. Um, so the first kind of more specific goal um, that the board has charged the district with working on is critical thinking. Um, and critical thinking is really tied to uh, 21st century skills. Um, and this is a mature end when it means, uh, again, mature ends in, in general mean that we've kind of exceeded the success thresholds for at least three years. And they're kind of self-sustaining on their own without a lot of additional input and resources from the district to keep them going. Um, so this is a mature end at this point in time. How we've interpreted this, and this was actually done with some work with the faculty at the time, is uh, the assessment is based upon the student performance on the senior project. And it was chosen um, as kind of the ideal means to measure this. Um, as it requires students to apply what they have learned across their Orange Southwest careers to solve unique problems. Further, students must communicate their process and findings effectively using appropriately te appropriate technology to explain their solutions. Because of this, the senior project rubric evaluates students on all the components related to critical thinking and is uniquely suited uh, to measure achievement of this end. So here is, uh, you know, 2021, 2022 data on, you know, student performance on the senior project. Um, graduating seniors who achieved proficient in all assessed categories was at 100%. 50% of the seniors actually uh, got exceeds on one of the, the four categories, uh, excuse me, one of the five categories. 30% got exceeds on three of the categories and 7% um, scored exceeds on all five categories. Therefore, I, I report that we are compliant um, on this provision. Foundational knowledge ends. Uh, the board has established six foundational knowledge ends related to English, mathematics, science, social studies, life skills, and the arts. Three of those ends are a current focus for improvement efforts and therefore are called critical ends. So what we're working on um, intensely uh, and, and supplying significant resources towards those are critical ends. Um, and those critical ends right now are English, mathematics, and science. Um, they were prioritized because they are the most visible to the outside world. They drive the perceptions of the quality of our schools, especially to new families moving into Vermont. And lastly, achievement in these three areas is required under federal law for the state and the district to continue receiving federal grant monies. Foundational knowledge. Um, the board's N121 calls for students to possess comprehensive knowledge of a core curriculum in the following areas, reading, writing, and communications. Right, so this is really the English, uh, English end. Um, this is categorized as a critical end because the district is highly engaged in its achievement and significant resources have been dedicated to this work. The English language SBAC was chosen to measure the attainment of this end because it's an objective measure. 
It assesses student achievement on the Common Core uh, language standards, which include reading, writing, and communication. Our performance relative to the state average was chosen as the threshold for success because Vermont is one of the few states that has equalized spending on education across its district. Because funding correlates to student achievement, equal funding should also equalize student performance. In other words, all things being equal, every district should perform about as well as every other district because funding has been equalized. Um, we have allowed for a three-point variance from the state average because all assessments, including the SBAC, have measurement error. Measurement error is the total variance in scores that would be seen if the same students took the test several times. In terms of the percentage of students reaching proficiency on the SBAC type exam, that variance typically amounts to about plus or minus three percentage points. So, kind of orient ourselves to the graph that's here first. Um, the blue line represents the percentage of our students in grades three to nine who have achieved proficiency on the English SBAC. The orange line represents the same data for the state. And when you look at this, three things are obvious. We are currently beating the state by about five percentage points. Students are performing better now than they were prior to COVID. And our scores have been rising while the states have been falling. And that occurred doing, during the years of COVID when doing any of this work was incredibly difficult. And so I've got to put the commendation um, out to the, the faculty for all the work that was done on this, as well as our uh, curriculum directors. Since we've exceeded the state average, this provision is in compliance. If we look at this data by grade, um, this graph shows how we are doing relative to the state at each grade level in English. For example, 14% more of the district's fifth graders are achieving proficiency in English compared to the state as a whole. The only grade where the state is outperforming us is grade seven, but we have been catching up over time. In 2019, the last year before COVID, grade seven trailed the state by 21 percentage points. It is currently trailing by eight. So there has been significant improvement. They're catching up um, pretty quickly and they did it during difficult conditions. Board's uh, N122 uh, calls for students to possess comprehensive knowledge of a core curriculum in mathematics. The mathematics SBAC was chosen because it too objectively assesses student achievement on the Common Core Learning Standards, which were interpreted as vital to compliance with this overall policy. The rationale behind this interpretation is the same as that that was discussed for the, the English uh, end. Um, math. The trend line shows that the OSSD stayed steady in terms of mathematic achievement while the state declined markedly during the COVID pandemic. Further, our students are currently performing better than they were pre-pandemic. The OSSD is currently outperforming the state by six percentage points. This is the first year looking back as far as I could look that the district has outperformed the state in math. It should be noted that in 2021, um, there was an anomaly in the scores from Randolph Elementary School that brought our total district score down. Um, RES scores dropped dramatically in 2021 and then jumped back up uh, to an even higher level than, than prior to in 2022. Um, we were unable to find the reason for the drop, um, but the quick return to high scores implies that this was not due um, to an actual loss of knowledge by the students. It seems like something quirky actually went on with the testing or the scoring of the tests. But that, um, that drop um, for 2021 should not have been that low. Um, again, that was an anomaly. In terms of, uh, and I think this one is impressive and there's a line here I'm gonna read twice. Um, this graph shows how we are doing relative to the state at each grade level in mathematics. For example, 34% more of the district's fourth graders are achieving proficiency in mathematics compared to the state as a whole. And why that is important is we had a discussion um, earlier this year when we just had to track my progress and start 360 data to look at that the two most difficult grades um, across the nation have historically been that way with state testing um, to have high performance are grades four and grades seven. And so again, 34% higher than the state. 
Um, grades seven and nine are underperforming the state by an average of six percentage points, but that gap has been narrowing quickly. In 2019, prior to COVID, those same grades were underperforming the state by an average of 19 percentage points. This is a significant improvement over time. They are moving in the right direction and moving rather quickly. And again, these improvements occurred during COVID, during difficult times. Science, the board's end, one, two, three, calls for students to possess comprehen comprehensive knowledge of science. Um, the Vermont Science Assessment was chosen, again, because of its ob it objectively assesses student achievement on the next generation science standards, which were interpreted as vital to compliance with the overall policy. The rationale behind the interpretation is the same as that discussed for English and, and mathematics, um, as the testing instrument is similar. Um, in this graph, you can see the percentage of OSSD, OSSD students who achieve science proficiency over the past four years three of which were impacted by COVID um, versus the state of Vermont. The trend line shows that the OSSD science performance has been improving over time relative to the state. Um, further, we are currently within three percentage points of the state average, therefore I report compliance. Um, the board's foundational knowledge ends in social studies, life skills, and the arts were all what we call perspective ends meaning that they were not previously a part of the district's improvement efforts due to the fact that limited resources were focused on ELA math and science. They have been upgraded this year to critical ends. We were able to acquire the resources needed in the last budget cycle to begin work in earnest on all three of these areas. This year, the curricular teams have been working on developing and revamping the curricula for these disciplines and interpreting what it means to have foundational knowledge in them. Most of that work is nearing completion Next year, they will focus on developing the measures they will use uh, to assess compliance. Um, there's not a lot of real kind of like standardized tests and things that are out there uh, for these disciplines. And so the departments are actually gonna be working on creating their own assessment systems, primarily rubrics. Um, and so that's their work for next year. So these are currently in the works. There was a significant amount of work that was done on them um, this year. Um, Social studies, uh, they have focused in on assessing the students in terms of having foundational knowledge and what they're calling um, document-based questions, um, which is actually a really good measure. Document-based questions or DBQs are an essay type that's used by the advanced placement exams, um, typically in social studies. Um, they're fantastic uh, because they require students to analyze an issue or topic with the aid of primary and secondary sources. They do a very good job of furthering students' social study knowledge as well as critical thinking and communication skills by requiring them to create um, strong theses and support those theses uh, with the aid of source materials. To analyze source materials for characteristics such as author's point of view, the author's purpose, intended audience, validity, and context to identify themes and contrast differences, and to bring in outside knowledge to strengthen their, their arguments. Um, so this is uh, the interpretation that the, the social studies department has revamped this year. Um, life skills, um, we had a, a series of listening sessions to determine pretty much what the basic skills the OSSD community felt were essential. And it was determined that the best way to deliver these skills was through the resurrection of um, a course called On Your Own that a lot of alumni here spoke quite fondly of. Um, and it had been a mandatory staple here for students until about a decade ago. Um, the prospective teacher, Deb Larry, has agreed to update the course curriculum um, using the essential skills identified during the listening sessions. And it should be noted that many of the critical skills that the, the community identified are already embedded in current courses. Um, those that are not, or which cannot easily be embedded, are the focus of this initial course. Um, this is a work in progress. That initial course will be up and running in the fall. Um, but during the next school year, 2023-2024, the district's going to evaluate the course rollout and the impact that it has on students. And then budget willing, we intend to create a series of semester courses that are taken at three different grade levels that focus on the skills that are most pertinent to a specific age of student. So for example, for grades seven and eight, um, the focus is gonna be on study and executive functioning skills. 
right, to set them up for success during their high school years. In grades nine and 10, we shift the focus to the social transitions that they're going through. And so the course would focus on social interactions and taking care of oneself. And in grades 11 and 12, um, that course would focus on kind of uh, financial literacy, personal financial literacy, um, interview and application skills to get them prepared for you know, entering the job market um, or applications for college. Yep. That first group, life skills, that age group, is mm -hmm. that like learning to use a daily planner and stuff like that? This is how you set up to study. Um, when you are learning vocabulary, here are some strategies that might work for you to really, you know, memorize those words. If you are dealing with uh, uh, what we call process learning, you know, like a cycle, this is the best strategy to use. So we're going to have you practice it. Um, and so those, those types of, of study skills. So the students are really prepared um, to be independent as they do their academic work. And so that they're ready uh, for those that go to college, that they've got the skills that they can just hit the ground running, know what they need to do to be successful. What grade is that happening? In? Those will be seven and eight. Yeah. That, okay. And again, grade seven, we talked about how grade four and grade seven, those are kind of critical years um, because students perform poorly. The reason they typically perform poorly in uh, across the nation on the state testing is because there's dramatic changes in terms of the expectations that are play, placed on them in terms of, you know, the amount of content they're exposed to and the difficulty of the content. Um, seven is usually the worst, so it makes sense to really make sure they've got the skills to hit the ground running in seventh grade. Um, and then hopefully carry it straight on through through the high school. So, um, and I, I, I love Deb. Deb is incredibly excited about um, being able to resurrect this and, and, and do this work. Um, so the, the intent is to make these courses mandatory um, for graduation. Um, starting with a yet to be determined class, it'll probably be the class of 2025 or 2026. So the course will, the first course will roll out next year. The year after that, hopefully we can get the other two courses in place. You know, it'll probably mean bringing on another staff member, which is fine if this is a priority. Um, and then making sure that we started as a graduation requirement um, with a class that has enough time to actually get it under their belts before they graduate. Um, so it's in pretty good stead. I'm, I'm really excited about some of the work that was done on this. Um, the Fine Arts Department is another department that's kind of starting a little bit, bit from scratch. Um, and they've done a really, really good job this work. So I'm going to read some of what they said in their own words. Um, the Fine Arts provides students with social emotional learning and gives them an outlet to process and regulate complicated emotions through creative expression and group <coughs> collabor collaboration through theater, art, and music. Students will produce evidence that shows a firm grasp of expertise and dexterity. Proof of this is demonstrated as performance, presentations, and displays. Assessing in this way gives students an opportunity to collaborate with their peers and also express themselves individually. These public-facing displays and events allow for a greater degree of community engagement and support. In terms of transferable skills, Critical thinking and adaptability in the arts engages problem solving and growth through the development of new physical and visual skills. Critical thinking isn't just about solving a problem or strategizing for an end result. It is teaching students to think intellectually, ethically, and creatively for the best possible outcomes. Next year, um, the Fine Arts dis Department, um, again, they, they're in a position they have to create their own assessment tools. So they'll be working on um, creating rubrics and calibrating rubrics that are based on the National Core Art Standards. So a lot of info <coughs> short, so I apologize, but. Uh, are there any new art classes being offered in the near future? We have been talking um, about bringing on AP Music. Um, in terms of the AP curriculum, certain courses hold more prestige than others, you know, calculus-based AP physics, you know, kind of being the pinnacle. The one that is closest to that, amazingly, is AP music. Um, and we have kids that are, are, are skilled enough and capable enough to be able to do that work. So that is a focus that we're trying to bring on board. And nothing in terms of art has, has been reduced or eliminated. Um, there's been some rumors about that, you know, in the last couple of years, and that has not happened. Um, 
so yeah, it's a strong program, and, and, and we've got a really good crew down there um, doing some amazing work. Is there like drawing one, drawing two, like all those classes? Yeah, um, you know, one of the things, and this is, a, this is a discussion for the art department, but it might require additional staffing. If you have a, a, a district or if you have a high school where you have a lot of students that are interested in going off to graphics design or going off to an art school itself, Typically what you want to do is, is uh, structure courses um, so that students can build a portfolio because that's how they're assessed to actually get into those schools. And those portfolios require the students to work in all the different media. So right, there's the charcoal drawings, there's the painting, and there's the sculpture at a minimum um, that those art schools you know, want to be able to evaluate finished products from the students um, if they're considering them you know, for, for a competitive school. So if that becomes a focus of the district, um, a focus of the community, that, that would be the way to build it and construct it. Um. Uh, the board's N1.3 calls for students to be adaptable, resilient, and able to manage change. This end is fairly complex, so it requires multiple data sources to ensure that information from all students contributes to the evaluation of compliance. Um, and so we start off with the idea in terms of adaptability that the capability for a student to manage the demands of the day-to-day -day changes that all of us face um, is really reflected in our ability to be consistent and dependable when it comes to our attendance, something that we talked about at the RTCC meeting a little while ago. Therefore, attendance is a valid means of measuring a person's ability to adapt to the temporary changes that affect our routines. The magnitude of change that students face as they progress through their middle and high school years is immense. They transition from children to adults physically, emotionally, and intellectually. And they transition from being dependent to being independent. Their ability to success successfully navigate these challenges and changes is easily measured by the percentage who make it through to graduation in four years, making a district graduation rate an effective measure of their adaptability. The only problem we have with this uh, data source is the state has not provided us with graduation rates um, for that year at this point in time. That said, our graduation rates have always been among the highest in the state. Um, the, this faculty has always done an exceptional job of, um, and so our attendance rates are actually quite high, you'll see that in a minute, um, has always done a, a very good job of um, being a kind and accepting place for kids. So they like being here. Um, so they show up, uh, they stick through to graduation. Um, in terms of bullet three on the slide, in general, students with disabilities often need assistance identifying and internalizing strategies for learning that allow them to compensate for the effects of their disabilities. The act of learning those strategies and using them effectively enough to either no longer need an IEP or to move along the continuum towards being on a less restrictive IEP is by its very definition adaptation. Data on average daily attendance um, is skewed a little bit um, in 2022 due to the impact of COVID, remembering that during that year, um, Districts were still required uh, to quarantine students, right? They had the quarantine requirements that were in place. And as a result, had to shut down either entire classes or schools um, as COVID infections kind of fluctuated throughout. Um, based on our calendar, students must miss no more than 17.7 .7 days per year for the district to be in compliance. Even in the midst of the pandemic, with all students attending in person, where exposure was the highest, the district was in compliance with this standard. Um, so on at least that prov provision of this, uh, this part of the end, we can report compliance. Um, in terms of student IEPs, um, the graph shows the percentage of the student's overall population that is served by an IEP. The state average has not been updated recently, but historical trends place it at about 14%, which is closely aligned with the historical national average. Um, there's some quirky data, especially in 2021. Um, a lot of things actually were happening. There was a surge of new students at the elementary level between 2021 and 2022. And a high majority of those new students coming in um, were on IEPs, um, which skewed this data a bit. 
um, regardless, the overall trend of our IEP population over time is downwards, and you can see that by the blue line. Um, in addition, we had a lot of regular education students who chose to homeschool during 2021 to avoid you know, exposure to COVID. And so if you have a, a group of uh, students that are on IEPs, even if the number of students on IEPs doesn't change, if the remainder of the population shrinks because they're homeschooling, you're going to see a surge in this number, even though we don't have more IEP students. And that's kind of what's happening, what you're seeing in the data. Um, again, standards and compliance because uh, the percentage of students on IEPs uh, as a percentage of the overall population is declining over time. Um, in terms of uh, IEP severity, um, this one is a little bit different. Um, so the above graph shows the average severity rating of students on IEPs. A higher number indicates a greater level of service being provided. The scores can range between one and six, but an IEP score higher than four is a very rare occurrence. Therefore, most of the numbers are gonna fall in a range between one and four. Um, as we kind of talked about a little, little while ago, there was a surge in new students on IEPs entering the district between 2021 and 2022, um, primarily at the elementary level, which resulted in the increase seen in 2022. Many of those incoming students needed a high level of services, and these were students new to the district. Um, the other thing that we're noticing is that we have expanded our preschool program, right, full day for all four-year-olds um, for free. Um, and that program is serving more and more students over time. And we're finding that the incoming preschool students have a high percentage of IEP needs. Um, those needs increase and have been increasing with every new class that we get. Currently, approximately 30 to 35 percent of incoming preschool students are in need of IEP services. Um, this standard is in compliance, again, because the percentage of students on IEPs is declining overall. Um, this interpretation has got to be updated um, next year uh, to not include students on IEPs who move in during the course of the school year because it skews our data. Um, we really only want to be looking at students uh, in the district that we had a full year with because that's evaluating the effectiveness of our programs, right? If you come in and you're in the data pool and we've never worked with you before, that's telling us nothing about whether the programs we're putting in a place to achieve, achieve this end is, is working. So if we only look at students that have been with us for a year or more under our programs, um, we're going to get more meaningful data. Digital literacy um, is, a, is an easy one. Um, board's end, this 1.4 expects that students use and apply information and technology appropriately, effectively, and objectively. We interpret this as meaning all students will use a Chromebook, computer, or tablet in a developmental, developmentally appropriate manner as the primary means of producing, managing, enhancing, and delivering their school-related work. In terms of the rationale for this interpretation, since the board description of this end relates to digital literacy, it made sense to use the American Library Association's definition of digital literacy as the guide to what constitute compliance. The, and how they word it is, it's the ability to use information and communication technologies, ICTs, to find, evaluate, create, and communicate information. The interpretation is therefore reasonable because it embodies all the components of the ALA's definition, the American Library Association's. Um, best way to measure the acquisition of a defined skill or defined skills such as these um, is to require the effective use of that skill set. By switching to a one-to-one -one model as a district is done, which requires students to use ICT devices as the primary means of learning and engagement, each student every day demonstrates compliance with this end. And again, I apologize, a lot of information, but I'm happy to answer questions or expand thoughts if there are any. And of course, the board had an opportunity to read the report prior to. What are the different kinds of ends, critical and? There's critical, mature, and perspective. We don't have perspective anymore. Critical ends are the ones that we are actively working on, putting in a lot of intense effort and directing a lot of district resources towards. And that's um, ELA, science, and math. ELA, science, and math, but it's also your social studies, your fine arts, and uh, 
life skills. Life, life skills. skills. And that's new. In because the we, 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 we acquired money in the budget to be able to go after those two at the same time. And that happened last year. So this is just a continuation. Yeah, that this. work, that work in terms of it, they converted to critical ends at the beginning of this year. And the, the faculty have, have been working on getting them up to where they need to be. So they got they got one more year for the most part because they got to develop the the assessment tools how they're going to be able to show that the kids are progressing towards um, the achievement thresholds and mature end. Uh, mature end means that we've dedicated a lot of time and effort um, to them, and they are currently above their achievement threshold, and they've been above their achievement threshold for more than three years. And they're kind of self-sustaining. You know, you put a lot of effort to get things where you want them to be. Once they're there, um, you can usually pull some of the resources and things off because that uh, achievement will continue because it's a part of the culture. Um, and we're not there yet with the one that we are with is uh, is digital literacy, right? Is a, is a mature and there's a couple of them that are in there. Um, and I can send this around so people can take a peek at. Um, right, ability to adapt is a critical end. We're actually in year two, right? We actually, this is one we <coughs> developed from scratch um, prior to COVID, um, but we're in year two of that. Arts, life skills, social studies, uh, they're in the process of developing their assessment tools. Um, critical ends are math, uh, science, and, and ELA, um, but they're getting there. And improving towards getting where they need to be. So, and again, we don't know what Cogni is going to tell us. Um, there's, it was a, it was a difficult rollout because it happened under short circumstances. There, I don't know whether they're, whether it's true or not. But there's a lot of concerns that those testing tools were created um, in a short period of time and may not be tied to Common Core or Next Generation Science Standards the way they should be. So it'll be interesting to see what happens when they release that data. And the kids are doing that testing right now. Um, you know, there'll, there'll be a lot of information that comes out when we see that data. Was the test valid? If it, if it was, you know, what, what, what is it indi indicating um, for us? What do you um, expect that data? Uh, I talked with Crystal about it. My, the sounds of it is October. My sneaking suspicion is that they are going to do what they did during the Vermont Science Assessment rollout. Um, the first year that they rolled it out, they released individual student data because we have to supply that to parents every year, right? We send the letters home about this is how your kid performed. Um, but they did not release school level or state level data because they said this was a trial year, you know, to work the bugs out. And so this very well may end up being, you know, we'll get the student data because under federal law, parents have to have that sheet in their hands for us to be in compliance and get our federal grants. Um, but they may say that, you know, this is a, a trial year and they may not release the, the school level and the state data. So we'll have to just kind of wait and see. Um, the projections I got from Crystal, and again, they're taking their best guess, is, is, is October for student level data. And I think she said potentially as late as February on state and school level, if, if, if they decide that they're going to distribute it. So. But as the, um, what's interesting is as the other groups, all the departments that are associated with those foundational eds are reinterpreting their ends um, statements and, and, and their interpretation. So that will be different next year when you see, see this. Um, you saw two of them in the report, you know, kind of where they're headed, but many of them recognizing the discombobulation of the state testing system. You know, they might use that as a data point, but they're bringing in some local stuff. I mean, we have Track My Progress and we have Star 360 that does the same thing as the state assessments. So you're gonna see in the next end reports that they're, they've decided to rely on different data that's a little bit more consistent. So that's been some good conversations that they've been having. It's been fun, fun to, to hear what they're coming up with and they've got some really good ideas. Questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Lane. Your throat must hurt. Yeah. No, and I apologize. It's long. It's just a lot of data to try to pack in. And I apologize no, for reading. Great. I don't usually do that, but that keeps me more concise. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so. great. I'm uh, thorough and I appreciate it. Uh, 
so there, so this is our second review. So um, next meeting we'll we'll um, vote to accept or not, as the case may be. Um, board discussion of RUHS and RTCC. This is something that um, had come up in a previous meeting, thinking about forming a subcommittee to start investigating what a rebuild would look like. Physical rebuild? Correct. Facilities? So of this, of uh, of this specific, this. yeah, facility, um, the, the tech center and the high school. And so we had kind of had, had kind of touched on that a, a, a little bit. Um, we we talked a little bit, right? The this complex was identified as the the complex that's the closest to the end of its useful life by the state when it was doing its survey right. work um, a year or so ago, as they were kind of investigating bringing back in a, a construction fund. Um, and so you know, kind of what I'm I'm proposing is I'm, I'm thinking about this is. Um, that the board, if if you're willing, um, you know, after after discussion and some thought, um, given the state of things, given that this is like we, we use the example of you know a used car that's 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 old that you know every month you got the you got the big bill coming in for something that you got to got to replace, um, that you know either you create potentially a subcommittee or charge um, the admin team. Um, to begin a study that would include um, at least three components. And the first one that I identified was just community discussions on the topic. Um, and I want to say this next piece twice so that people don't freak out. Um, part of the, the community discussion, because a rebuilding like this, if we were to run forward with it, might happen once in 100 years. And I am not advocating um, for consolidating the district, but I think it's a conversation that needs to occur if we're thinking about potentially new construction which is do we have a central campus you know do we build like a building that's got a central structure where all the common um, areas are that can be used with wings that go off you know one wing that's high school one wing that's middle school one wing that's elementary school you know that's a possibility um, and to study what the savings might be if we do that over you know running separate buildings again i want to be very clear i'm gonna look in the camera when i say this i am not advocating that we do that but I think it would be a lack of due diligence not to at least have the discussion if we're potentially looking at a once in a hundred year possibility of, of reconstructing um, this site. And so that would be the first piece of the, the study group. The second piece would be to get some professionals in to kind of investigate possible sites to see where it actually is possible to build. Um, while we keep this site active because the kids will still need to be learning while um, construction happened and then maybe to connect with um, an architectural firm um, to start to draw up some potential plans um, based upon what we're getting out of the community discussions um, this is a, it can be a, a fairly costly process and so people need to know that in terms of a study especially with the architectural piece involved you know, this this might be a hundred thousand, hundred and fifty thousand dollar process, um, but it is the first step. It's it would be required. You know, if you know we decided at some point in time, and the communities did that, we wanted to move forward with it. Um, we've got two point two million sitting in our facilities reserve fund right now, so there is more than enough money to to be able to do do that study if we wanted to do it. So I'll shut up for a little while and. If, if folks have thoughts. How and, much does a new school typically cost? Didn't you say it was like? It depends, depends what we do. You know, if we consolidate, if we keep it separate. I would, again, off the, the cuff, thinking about Burlington and, and the work that they're doing there, which is a much bigger complex um, than ours, I would probably say you're talking 150 to 175 million, depending upon what you do. Um, but, if the state through construction aid, so here's a couple of things to investigate. If this state through construction aid is going to pay for half of that or more or a little less, you know, is that an opportunity that we would want to let pass by? Um, we should know more about that by, by the next legislative session. Um, but if it costs $75 million and we have $2 million, it's not as a big gap. Yeah. And the, the, well, the other the other possibility and the other reason to potentially think about consolidation is right. You know, it would have to go out to bond, which means we take out a loan and we've got to pay on the loan. Um, but 
if we consolidate, there might be enough savings from that to more than cover, you know, the increased costs each year of what we've got to pay on the loan. So again, there's that that money piece um, that's in there, right? If, if if because we've consolidated, we're not paying as much because we're running one one main building instead of you know three separate ones or four separate ones, however you want to look at it. Um, there's going to be some savings there. They could be significant enough to cover the cost of the the the, the bond that we take out. We literally just finished paying off um, Randolph Elementary. I think it was two years ago. Um, they, they went out to bond on that. I don't remember what the cost was at the time. So I think it's a good idea to have the first step be the community discussion where you decide who the school is actually for. Yeah, yeah. And again, I'm not advocating for one. There's there's pros and cons to every to each piece. Um, having community elementary schools is is an American tradition. Um, it's just it's it's across the country. That's just how it's done. And so that's a, a thing that's hard for people to even imagine. Um, giving up and it, it makes sense. Um, but it's, uh, you know, those are the, the types of rich discussions I think we should have because if we don't um, and we do the construction, it'll be another hundred years before you could consider, you know, that possibility. Um, Sam, did you have something? Did you start talking? Yeah. <clears throat> I did, I did not, I, but I do have something to say. Okay. Um, I think it would be prudent as we navigate this topic and concept to look at existing infrastructure as well. Um, we talked, we mentioned, talked about this briefly in the our DC meeting just prior about um, uh, VTC's complex up in the center. Um, so that would be one point that I had. And the second point would just be around energy efficiency and uh, the, the future of, um, I mean, building a hundred year school, we gotta make sure we can fuel it, so. Yeah, there's um, a lot of the discussions, we, we touched on this at the tech center would be, um, you know, going full solar for the heating and cooling, you know, using heat pumps to actually do that. So that's a reduced cost. Um, don't quote me when I was doing research on it, probably just before COVID hit, um, you know, that was a three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar a year savings if we did something like that. Um, the problem was, is at that time you could only generate so much electricity from from your own site. Um, and it wasn't enough to even come anywhere close to covering our full needs. Those laws may have been loosened and those regulations may have changed if we could you know, build a, a solar panel site that would cover our full electrical needs and our heating and cooling needs, that would be a significant savings. Again, so that you know, we're not having to ask for taxpayers to pony up more so that we're paying off a bond. Well, for sure, we should not leave any stone unturned when looking at yeah. the different options. And that's why the studies, you know, we, you know there's, there's certain conversations that, you know, we or the board could have with the community, but we want to get some professionals in that know all the ins and outs and, and what's possible and what can be done to, 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 to do the study with us uh, would be important. So what are you looking for here, like a committee to form or... Oh, if there's if there's an interest in if there's an interest in terms of the board, um, first off to to investigate this um, because you are the representatives of the the communities. I do know when I mentioned it um, in an open forum or two at the beginning of the school year, it was thumbs up by everybody that was there, um, and then decide what process you want to use. Do you want to have a subcommittee of the board that oversees this and runs this, or do you want to char charge you know? Heather and I and a couple of the other administrators I can pull in um, and fa the facilities directors to kind of start this work. Or a combination. Yeah. A combination yeah. might be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, does the administration, do you guys have bandwidth? I mean, it, it feels like not a small in project to just begin investigating it. I personally do feel it is necessary to start that process. Um, but it sounds like there will need to be an appropriation of some money to move out of that two million reserve. Um, start to look at this, but does the board have bandwidth to do that, and does the administration have bandwidth to do that? And that's just my only concern about making a motion right now. Hey, Wes, are you, are you there? I see your picture. 
These are one of our co-facilities directors. He's probably eating dinner. <laughs> but no, he was he, he literally is at this meeting because he was excited about the potential mm -hmm. um, of, of being able to get started. Same thing with, with uh, Bob Worley, our other co-facilities director, about potentially doing this work. Because they're the ones that are, they're, that are cleaning up the things that aren't working every day. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so they've got a pretty good indication of, of, of what's what. Um, so I think the the facilities directors it'll it'll be a lot of work, but you know the community discussions and things um, that's not going to be much additional um, because it's just integrated into what we already do. I already meet monthly with the community. I meet monthly with the staff with the listening sessions now, um, and so those discussions can just be you know be refocused to this purpose so that's not a lot of extra um, the study components of it would require outside professionals to come in and actually do those mm -hmm. things you know walk our grounds you know see if the 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 soil and, and whatnot is right out there if we wanted to build in the backfield um, or if there's a better location that we should pursue um, they would also be vital to going up and you know if we have the conversation with vermont tech to go in and inspect those facilities and give us an idea of what shape they're in and be able to produce um, because regardless of the shape that they're in they're going to need to be modified a little bit to our purposes what that cost would be so that we can have some cost comparisons between building new and potentially purchasing up there if they even have it available and like we talked about at rtcc i know that vermont tech did a lot of deferred maintenance right there's a lot of work and maintenance that they didn't do on those buildings because they couldn't afford it you know, what does that mean in terms of additional, you know, input of capital that we'd have to do to, to get them up to our, our needs? I really like the Vermont Tech possibility, um, but again, we'd have to get some really hard numbers. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to build new on existing property. It's another to buy the property and then have to do the construction anyway on top of it. Um, but, yeah. Well, it seems like there should be some kind of committee formed to just start the discussion with Vermont State Colleges and like, you know, whatever, looking at all the different yeah. things. And VTC has always been very accommodating when we ask questions, um, even ones like this. So it's easy enough to reach out. But, so is there, is there an appetite for? Yeah. Or is it more I an mean, there is. I think so. Yeah. I don't know how everybody else feels. I feel like I'm doing all the talking tonight. Well, there was nodding, so it was silent talking. Okay. I, I saw a nod up there and <laughs> some in here. It makes the most sense to me that it would be a combined um, committee. Committee. Mm -hmm. All right, Sam, you were hesitant though to to vote on on creating one. No. Is that no? No. I am. <clears throat> I think. I, I believe the right step and next step in the process to make a motion to develop a committee that is both comprised of board input and administration input to start the process to communicate with the community um, on the prospect. I, and then I think from there, we should figure out the money side of it and bringing in the expertise and what's needed next. Um, so that's my two cents and I can regurgitate that into a motion if people want. Well, might you be interested in, in being the board representative on that committee or is there someone else in the room who might be interested in that? Um, I, I would be happily interested in that uh, if other people wanted me in on that. It, it is there a, a motion in there for anyone? I move that we form a committee to start the process of looking at a new facility with Sam administration, possible staff. Do I have a possible second? community I members? That. Sarah seconds. Any more discussion? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Passes. Okay, let's try to rapid fire through these. Um, first review of EL 2.7 compensation and benefits. Lane, anything to. Uh, no, um, basically that. That's the final EL report for the cycle. Um, basically, it's looking and kind of putting parameters around how we determine compensation and benefits for like non-unionized employees mm -hmm. and the contracts that, that we connect with. Um, and a lot of it is making sure that what we are offering is fair and competitive, competitive but not excessive, right, based mm -hmm. upon, you know, what the comparables are out and about and so you know at this i report compliance in terms of what's in there right now um, but happy to ask questions um th this time or next time around about it does anyone teacher salaries so teachers are unionized so no um we have some folks that are on um, special contracts like uh some of our social workers and things if if you don't hold an aoe license you, you're you're not typically um in your professional you're not typically in the union um, we've got like um, our drug and alcohol um, secession person that works with us. Um, if we, you know, contract out with like, you know, Lodge and Nest or something like that to do work here. Um, if we contract out, we have a BCBA that's out in Colorado um, that does work for us. It's, it's making sure that, you know, what we're providing them for a salary, again, is fair, um, fair and competitive but not excessive. Um, part of it, too, if you kind of read between the lines, is making sure that, you know, as, as superintendent or as a business manager, as a district, that, you know, we're not, we're not showing favoritism. You know, oh, you're, you're a friend, so I'm going to pay you 10 grand more than I would anybody else. Um, there's that, that aspect of it, too. Okay. So this is the first reading. Are there more questions? Excellent. Thank you, Lane. How about a legislative update? So like? yeah, so that was um, the primary focus of the uh, superintendent's report was there. So there wasn't a lot changed with the exception of, of, of two bills that they're working on since kind of the last time we talked in April. Um, the first is uh, the state is kind of seeking to create legislation um, around school safety um, in response to the hoax calls that, that, that came out um, you know, a few months back. Um, and the safety that they're looking at is um, in terms of you know, processes and procedures for controlling entry into buildings, um, as well as um, making sure that districts have a, a, a well-defined threat assessment system. So right, you get a report that you, know, you have a student that may have a gun or maybe a shooter. You know, what are the steps that you go through to evaluate whether there's a real risk there and what your response is going to be? Um, the reality is, is it's not bad legislation, but all schools have this stuff anyway at this point in time. Um, and just to, to put it out there so that our, our community knows our threat assessment um, protocols were redone in 2021. Um, I went down, at, uh, did some work, um, and had a training with... Uh, an actual FBI uh, director, and then our threat assessment protocol was based upon their their research. Um, so we've got a pretty solid one. Um, we don't share it much um, because we don't want people to be able to navigate around the protocols that we put into place. Um, but 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 we have used it. And it has been, has been quite effective. Um, the other piece uh, was just more of an interest. Um, is that recently they are talking about putting together a study committee um, to take a look at the impact of the standards-based report cards and the graduation proficiencies that they ordered all schools to put into place about five years ago. Um, there's been a lot of pushback from, from a lot of communities that it's confusing. It's not, you know, as effective. There's Wes. I didn't do it. We had, we had, a, we had a question for you. <laughs> oh. um, and you're, on, you're online, too. And so uh, what will yeah. go ahead. What will happen with it is, um, you know, it might end up that we go back to the old A, B, C, D, F grades, um, depending upon, you know, what the result of the study is. So those are just the, the two we use those one, pieces. one, two, three, four now? One, two, three, four. Kind of means the same thing in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's easy to figure out though because of the GPA stand. So in high school, it's so much easier. Yeah. I feel like when it's like that, yeah. and proficient, not proficient, all the, those in between. Yeah. That was the, the 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 state, you know, because the superintendents. Um, group has talked about it. Um, the problem with the standards-based grading is it's, it can be very time intensive for the, the teachers, um, right? Because, you know, if you got, you got 112 standards in your class and you've got to rate every kid on every standard, um, that can be a lot of time. And then the question is, is the amount of time that the teachers are putting in to do this work commensurate with the benefit that we get from it? Mm -hmm. And so I'm on, I'm on the side that I think it takes too much time for the teachers to do and that time could be better spent um, on other things on behalf of kids. Um, but there are a lot of um, very strong proponents for it and they have good arguments. Um, you know, it, it's, it really spells out, you know, what the kids are supposed to learn, keeps it at the forefront of their mind. And yeah, so there, there's, you know, there's good arguments on both sides. So, but those are, those are the two biggies. Great. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda, um, and let's not forget that there are a couple of additions. Um, professional contracts, there are actually three. Administrator one, and there's an added facilities reserve uh, request for the gym floor. Actually, all the administrators, the current administrators are in there. The new administrator is the one addition. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can we do this as a whole, this consent agenda? Does anyone have uh, edits to the minutes, for example, before we? Oh, yeah, I didn't, didn't, did we vote that at the beginning? We may not have. Um, what, Linda, reserve, no. yeah. Well, not, not just the reserve. Uh, we had talked a little bit about, given the time of year it is, usually this year the board um, considers a vote to give me the authority to sign people to contracts oh. just because it gets real competitive. I don't remember if we added that or not. If not, we can do it at the next meeting. I don't remember adding We did not. Yeah, I so we'll, no, that's okay. We'll do, we'll do it at the ne next meeting. It's funny that you reminded me about five minutes before the meeting started. No. I still did not manage it. Yeah, that. no, it's, that, it's my, my, my fault, so don't stress. Sorry. Okay. Don't think Uh... Can I have oh, a motion? I was just going to say, I'll move to approve the consent agenda with the addition of the additional contracts um, and the reserve the reserve fund, whatever I added before. Um, yes, all together. Okay, I'll second that. Thank you, Sarah. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. They say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Great, it passes. Uh, in closing, Lane, anything to add? Uh, your report, well, it was pretty much the legislative update. Yeah. Um, financials? Financials were doing really well. Yeah. We're did, well, well in the black. Did anyone spot anything they have questions for Lane about in the financials? Um, Katya is not here. I do know for a fact that gift cards are being. Yep. Yeah. 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 We sent your a, email. Yeah, we sent a message out mm -hmm. um, to to the staff thanking them on on behalf of both the admin and, and the work for um, from the board. Um, talked about the gift cards, and then we also did service bins for them. I didn't get them out the end of the week. We moved today, or we're in the process of moving today. So yeah. <laughs> You get a break from that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I just had one thing on the gift cards. I talked with my accountant about the legality of uh, expiration dates, and it is true. You cannot, they can't have an expiration date, but they can be, it, for the business owners who ask questions about that, they can do a journal entry adjustment at 1231 and move it as revenue, but the the because the gift card is currency it cannot have expiration so just that's the only thing there if anybody asks about that or if i don't know what we ended up deciding on that front but uh just fyi yeah yeah i don't no think they have one things. although one of the businesses today hoped we could put a couple months because she felt that 
people forgot to use them. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, yeah, we, I don't think it's on there. I mean, so. the, the district can. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's on. Yeah. Um, businesses, if they want to try to put one on there, even yeah. though they're so I didn't argue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, action items recap. We we formed a couple of subcommittees today, so. Um, for instance, yeah. Chelsea and I need to to meet with Ben. Um, Sam, thank you for uh, being on the subcommittee to start looking at maybe investigating. Um, yeah, great. Okay, this is a long one. I'm sorry, guys. I did not do good at time management today. Well, I screwed it up. So um, no, I don't have it. Uh, we do have an executive session couple of topics so if I could Sam do you have the link you're finding the link I can send it out again I, if you I have, have I have the link I'm trying to find my uh, my meeting notes so go ahead oh, keep going okay. I got it um, <laughs> do I have a motion to go into executive session so moved second thank you Megan thank you Sarah all those in favor uh, that's my action. can I get this Aye. Who did what there? Uh, uh, Megan moved that we go into executive session. It's 8-17. Sarah seconded. And do you want uh, either of us there? Ah, that was not moved. Oh, do you sorry. want to amend your motion? Uh, yes, I would like to amend my motion. And who am I to include, to include them for litigation? Okay, so I am amending and I would like to include Lane and Heather for litigation. Thank you. And I second that. Motion just pull that up. Okay. Okay. Uh, with no action to be taken, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Megan, thank Second. you. Thank you for seconding, Sarah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourned.